Some people are like, it's too big. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's good. You still teach No, I haven't taught here for about six years. I taught for at least three. But I, but now I have the scholars. I have. The, 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 they're not part of the school that's called the Outlaws. And um, it's just kind of a private group. Just sell the desk. And they're coming now. So it's kind of like a little flashback to the baseballers here. And I miss those things. That was fun. Yeah. I like, I really like the Junior Outlaws. You need to get what's behind the key. Oh, yeah. this evening for your patience we you know it's the weather's been cold and travel is not exactly easy in Montana sometimes so thank you so much for understanding um, we are welcoming our panelists as many of them are arriving and they'll be introducing themselves to you shortly um, we wanted to go ahead and let you know um, first of all there's some organizations that came together tonight to make this happen for Miles City and I want to acknowledge those organizations for you we have the United Christian Church of Miles City that helped us with travel expenses food expenses and I'm very thankful for their sponsorship we also had the local Sonata organization our Custer Network Against Domestic Abuse and Violence they also were one of our sponsoring organizations to bring everybody here 
and then also the your local Mile City AAUW, the American Association of University Women, helped us bring all of these panelists to Mile City. Some of them have traveled pretty far, so I want to acknowledge all of those organizations. And then finally, our local Tongue River Winery Bed and Breakfast uh, is able to put up some of our panelists for the evening, and we appreciate their generosity. So I want to take a moment and acknowledge all of those organizations. Thank you. We'll be breaking up our evening into three separate sections. And just because uh, this is going to be, I think, a very powerful and impactful evening, we're going to ask the audience to please hold their questions until the end of each section, just to make sure that we give our panelists the space to speak, and that we also make sure that any questions you do have are answered. Um, the first section will be talking about the past, the uh, past events that happened that have led to this or to the crisis that we face today, and then we will take questions. And then finally, uh, excuse me, then in the middle, we will have um, our, <laughs> we will have our uh, section on the present, where we're talking about current legislative action, both at the state and federal level. We have action both at the state and federal level that is uh, currently in the works. And then finally, we're going to be looking at our future, uh, what communities like Miles City can do, what the future looks like for reservations, what the future looks like for Montana, what the future looks like for this crisis. Okay? If you feel like you have questions, uh, but you won't remember them, we do have cards and note paper available up here or if you need to write anything down. You'll also find uh, Kleenex on uh, most of the tables. So I'm going to go ahead and welcome a couple more of our panelists to come up and join me here at the front, and then we'll go ahead and we'll get started with our evening. do have a couple more panelists who will be sneaking in as we'll let them, but I'm going to go ahead and turn the microphone over to our special guests and allow them to introduce themselves to our group today. Hello, my name is Beth McCoy. I'm the Executive Director with the Custer Network Against Domestic Abuse here in Miles City, also stands for Sonata. Uh, we provide services to those affected by domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking in Garfield, Custer, uh, Fallon, Rosebud, Treasure, and Powder River County. Um, we, we assist in serving those in Rosebud with our partners out of Healing Hearts here, who will introduce themselves just shortly. Good evening. My name is Melinda Harris Limberham. I'm an advocate for MMIW. My daughter was murdered on um, July 4th, 2013. Um, I wasn't going to let my daughter slip through the cracks, so I organized a lot of walks for my daughter, and um, we established uh, May 5th for missing and murdered Indigenous women, so everybody can wear red on that day. Um, in the process of um, helping pass House Bill 21, Hannah's Act through the Montana Legislature, which, is a, which will be held uh, on the 10th and 11th, I do believe, in Helena. Um, I also speak for um, the missing and murdered men also because I believe that we're all equal in God's eyes. So, thank you. Hi, I'm Meredith McConnell. <clears throat> I'm the uh, director of Healing Hearts out of Langdeer, Montana. Um, our program is a domestic violence program and we provide services for victims of domestic violence and sexual assault on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. Um, I've been with Healing Heart since 2015, and um, we are currently um, providing support and advocacy. Uh, we transport victims to shelters or safe homes. Uh, we also assist with protection orders. I currently have uh, three staff members that are also in the audience, Carla mm -hmm. is one of the DV advocates, um, and then I'll go ahead and introduce Martina Minigun. She's uh, with the Montana Native Women's Coalition. I guess I should uh, go ahead and mention the coalition. 
I also sit as the board chair for the Montana Native Women's Coalition. My name is uh, Bailey Brown. Um, when I was 12, I found out that my biological father and my brothers actually, I grew up in Gillette, Wyoming, and they actually lived in Ashland, Montana on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. And I guess I started my education on these issues at that time. Um, I ended up going to college and studying criminal justice and sociology, which kind of really cemented the foundation of what I already knew was happening and, you know, put that science background to it. Um, I now work as a, I work at a, as a caseworker for an addiction treatment. I work with women who are getting their kids back from CPS, and I do a lot of writing and um, activism, direct action as it relates to indigenous issues. And then in 2017, my brother was murdered in Lame Deer. Um, and just gave me that really unfortunate first-hand experience of these issues. Um, his murderer was found guilty in federal court, which does not happen very often, but was only sentenced to four years in prison. Hello, my name is Charlene Sleeper. I'm Southern Cheyenne Arapaho. Um, <laughs> my MMIP work started kind of a uh, as a result of looking into chronic inebriation in Billings, Montana, um, as a commissioner on the Billings Human Relations Commission. Um, it is a factor to MMIP. Um, currently, I'm working on creating a city to tribe uh, commission to examine all of the factors that go into that. Uh, I work with, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, uh, I'm a CASA advocate, so I work with um, that program. As a volunteer, I'm also a Citizens Police Academy uh, alumni, so I work within those realms. Um, and currently exploring, um, oh, what, how would we word that? It's, it's a Center for Creative uh, Writing, <laughs> trying to establish um, poetry education in uh, Title I schools and buildings uh, as a trauma treatment option, kind of, so they can process, you know. Uh, Title I schools tend to have a lot of children in foster care, so yeah, that's really much. So. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> okay. My name is Paula Castro Stops. Um, I am Scott's mother. I knew it this so you have to excuse me. My daughter was missing and we found her murdered in December. And I have just now become a speaker about the MMIW. And it's helping me with my healing. Um, it's going to be a long process, but I'm, I'm doing this for my daughter because this has gone on for too long and it needs to stop. I'm sorry. So I start to speak about what has happened to her. It's hard for me. Um, I know I'm not alone. I'm thankful for Melinda. She's helped me through a lot of this, from finding my daughter to help finding her for her missing her report. And so yeah, we've been through a lot together. And I'm thankful for Melinda. Thank you, Thank you. Okay, and as we said, we're going to be starting with the past, and we'll have our various panelists speak on this particular topic. There is no order to the panelists, and you may not even hear from all of the panelists during a particular section of this evening.
just to share a little more about our organization in uh, Mile City here. Many of you are familiar with Caroline Fleming, who was a big um, part of forming Sonata uh, in 1996 with Barb Bile. Uh, it was really a grass movement in our area, um, taking hands with other women and hearing their stories of abuse and sexual assault, um, and really being met with a lot of adversity in trying to move forward in the work to bring awareness to the abuse that was happening um, behind the lines. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, societal stigmas that have made it extremely hard to bring these issues to light in our area. And so we're just here to offer a listening ear um, and really offer our alliance and our support to all the people who are here today um, and really learn what we can do to further uh, the advocacy in this movement as we move forward. So I just want to thank everybody who made the made the trip here today. I see a lot of familiar faces um, and a lot of new faces. So thank you everyone for coming together for this. I really appreciate it. Um, my staff members are in the back, so if at any point anybody needs to step out, um, please feel free to just do that. <coughs> Again, thank you. My name is Melinda Harris, number <coughs> Um, this has been an epidemic on our reservation for many years. Um, the very first time that I experienced um, murder was I was probably about 15 years old. Um, one of my friends, my, one of my classmates, were, were found deceased at a after a party, a, a party, and um, she was pregnant at the time. And so that's when the very first time that I've ever experienced um, murder and death, and and that's a pretty young age. So for me, um, since that was my friend, I kind of had to um, take a step back and always be aware of my surroundings and stuff like that way. Um, the second time that I experienced death, um, I had an a auntie, her name was Rosella Wooden Thigh. And she was brutally murdered in Ashton. And um, they raped her. There was three of them. There was a father, a son, and a friend. Um, they raped her. They shot her in the head. They um, dismembered her. They threw her on a car, and they were trying to go throw her in the river, and her body fell off the car, and she got ran over. They ran her over while she was already deceased. Um, they decided to burn her. Um, she was burning for three days. Um, the, the people that did this, the men that did this, committed suicide about three weeks later. He, um, he took the ease away out, I always say. He didn't want to stay in. Um, but his son got a lot of years and his friend, I really don't know how many years, but that was the second time that I've experienced that in my life. And then with my daughter Hannah, um, I was in July 4, 2013. Um, it was really a hot, hot summer that summer. Um, we usually have a 4th of July powwow that goes on and there's a dance that goes along with the fireworks and stuff, and um, I worked at the depot, and I wasn't able to show up over there. My last words to my daughter were, I'm tired, can you go across to your uncle's, can you, then you can come pick me back up and we'll go to the fireworks together. And she said, yeah, when her and the baby left. Um, I never did see my daughter after that. I worked at the depot in Lame Deer, and um, so my search started that morning. I started asking around for my daughter, and I found out that her car was parked up at Muddy. And it was a really long struggle for me to 
ask everybody and then work at the same time. It was really, really emotional day for me because I wanted to know where my daughter was at. And everybody kept telling me well, that she was last seen with this one and this one. And I pretty much did my own investigation. I, I'm not no detective or anything, but when you're a mom and your daughter goes missing, you do anything in your power to find her whether it be driving 20, 30 miles away to see if she's there. but So I drove all over after work. I started asking around and stuff, and nobody's seen her, but we had her car, so I went up there to, the, to her car. And everything looked all right. It was just like she might have just ran out of gas and left and just left her car on the side of the road. But I really started getting worried because her son was only like nine, ten months old at the time, and she was breastfeeding him. So I knew that she wouldn't be gone for too long. I reported her missing on that Thursday. And this was on a Wednesday when the when the dance went on, and then on the Thursday, I looked for her. Then that Friday, we decided to turn her in as a missing person. When I got down to the police department to return or to report her missing, I was told that she's probably just out drinking somewhere, scared to come home. And I told him right then and there, no, it's not like that way. She would never leave her son. She'd always call. She always comes home. She don't do this. And they were like, well, it's a Friday night. It's the powwow weekend. If you guys don't find her by Monday, then we'll step in. But if you guys want to search for her on your own, you can. And so I went home and I told my family, and my brother called up um, to search and rescue. And they said, well, why wait till Monday? Let's go look for her now. So on that Friday, we started searching. They went out and they searched where, where her car was found. Um, in the process, we probably ruined a lot of evidence, but you know, it was just up to us to go out and find my own, our daughter, so whatever we found, we just kind of like make sure just one person would touch it and we'd wrap it up and put it in a Ziploc bag. Um, I come to find out that she was with, these, with this couple and um, I started looking all over for this couple and I finally found them on Saturday. I found her at the gas station, I mean at the store. <coughs> And I walked up to her and I said, you were the last one to be seen with my daughter. I don't want to hear nothing from you. I'm going to take you to the police department. So she jumped on with me and I took her to the police department. <clears throat> and I walked in there and I said, this lady was the last one seen with my daughter. I want you guys to interview her. And so they sat down and they asked her her name and when was the last time she was seen with her. And um, she was trying to say that some cowboy guy was with them, and I already kind of had a feeling, but me and myself, I never ever did want to admit that she was gone or missing. Um, I always had that hope that she's going to show up. So when, she, when I took her to the police department, she started lying to the police. Um, I was just devastated. And then the cops said, well, I asked about the car, and I said, well, what about the car since she was sitting there? And he told me, well, let's go look at it. And instead of having the, um, the lady jump into the police car with them so they can question her on the way up, they, they just kind of like told her, you can go. And I told her, no, you're not going nowhere. You're jumping on the car with me. If the cops ain't going to take you, you're jumping on with me. So she jumped on with us. And we started asking her questions. How's this guy look? How tall was he? How big is he? What color was he? And she was just like kind of making stuff up and stuff. But um, I didn't know if she was telling the truth or not. Like I said, I, I was just always hoping that my daughter was going to come out from somewhere, but in the meantime, we get up there to the police, I mean to the car, and the police just walk around the car and they said, there's no signs of foul play, go ahead and move your car, and I, and I was like, no, 
nobody's going to touch this car if you guys, I mean, I don't, I don't know what's happening here, you know, but I watched enough TV shows to know that, you know, you're not supposed to touch, touch themes and so. My daughter's car sat on the side of the road for about a week, maybe, and I just told everybody, please don't touch the vehicle, and everybody didn't, they'd left the car alone. But anyways, they let her go, and that Saturday we were doing another, we searched again that evening. That Sunday we searched again, and more and more people were coming out to help search because we posted it on Facebook page. If they wanted to come help and search, that they could. And by the time Monday came around, we probably had about 100 searchers. And it was a really nice day out that day. Towards the evening time, there was a big old thunderstorm that was coming in. And um, we decided, or the search and risk group decided to um, postponed the search till the next day and that was at six o'clock that <coughs> time and they said everybody could go home so everybody went home I went home and um, we start we we do a ceremony on a reservation and um, I, I really can't get into the ceremony with you guys and stuff but um, it's to call the um, spirit back. And while we were doing the ceremony, we get a knock on the door, and we just can't get up and answer the door in the middle of a ceremony. And so we just let that person knock. They knock for about 15, 20 minutes before finally they said, go ahead, go answer the door, we're done. So when I get up and I answer the door, it was a police officer standing there, and he said, he asked me, he said, does your daughter have any tattoos that we can identify her? identify her by and so I told him about the tattoos and stuff and those were the words that I didn't want to hear and man I just like didn't want to believe them and so I was like then people started calling me up telling me that they found my daughter and I just told them I don't want to hear it unless I hear from a police officer at the FBI, I'm not going to believe any of these rumors. And at uh, 12 o'clock I get a knock on my door and it was a police officer and they told me that they found my daughter. She was deceased. She was um, laying in the hot sun for five days out there that her body was so decayed that they couldn't find no evidence on her. And with Gina telling all her lies to the cops, we didn't know who we were looking for. Um, two weeks later, the chief of police came into my house and he told me, he said, I have this couple in my jail for years. I've known them for years. I don't think they're capable of doing that to your daughter. And I really got mad and I told him, get the fuck out of my house, I'll come back. I called up FBI and I told him what he said. And I told him I didn't want him in my house or anything, that I didn't want anything to do with him because he was already taking sides. And right then and there, I made my decision that I wasn't going to let my daughter slip through the cracks. So I, so me and my family started um, doing marches. Um, I always remember my very first march. I got up there and I told everybody, I'm sick and tired of everybody getting away with murder. I'm not going to let this slip through the cracks. My daughter is not going to be forgotten. And from there, I start, we started doing walks. Um, probably about my third walk, Rennie, what she, she's supposed to have been here, but um, she just she told me, she said, well, let's do a walk for all, justice for all. So instead of just walking for my daughter, we started walking for all the murders, missing and murdered on our reservation. And that turned out really great. It was, it was time for people to 
finally come out and speak on behalf of their missing and murdered loved ones. We had a great turnout and I was just blown away of, of how many people that there were on our reservation. Um, half of those were brought to justice. Um, we have one male still missing right now and one female. One female. Her name is um, Blue Harding and his name is um, Limber, James Limberhand. Um, and we got one active that's still being investigated, and that's Henny. And so from there, it was just a long journey, and um, our, um, the one who was the search and rescue, he got hired as the, in hard, and I can't remember what he got hired for, but um, he's the one that rolled up the um, May 5th as an Indigenous Women's Day for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. And he took it all the way to Helena and um, Senator um, Danes took it all the way to Washington, D.C. and presented it. Um, so May 5th is a set aside for our missing and murdered indigenous women and girls on behalf of Hannah. Um, and then after that, um, I kind of got cancer and I kind of put my life on, life away because of, of my chemo and stuff. And I always kind of think the reason that I got cancer is because of all the stress. It's very stressful. This is a very stressful thing that us women mothers have to go through. And now I look at, look at the outcome of life. I didn't know that this is what God had in store for me. Um, starting to talk and be an advocate for all the mothers and daughters and sisters and husbands and wives that don't have no voice for their missing or murdered indigenous woman. And so, um, back to my story. Um, I had to raise money in order for somebody to talk. Um, we came up with $7,750 around that much. And we, we posted it and um, we wanted somebody to come forward with information. It took us a good nine months to a year before before we finally got the news that somebody somebody came forward with information and they picked up the husband and the wife at the same time. The husband got picked up in Wyoming and the wife got picked up in Rapid City. So they couldn't tell their stories. I mean, their stories, they wouldn't be able to communicate with each other. Um, we did go to court and um, the lady said that when she woke up, the husband was raping my daughter and she went in there to help Hannah. And, um, while she was trying to help Hannah, Hannah must have accidentally hit her and she got mad and she jumped on Hannah and she strangled her to death. <clears throat> they wrapped her up in a blanket and they just threw her out of the door like a piece of trash. And the next morning they decided to move her. They one got her his son's car and they moved her body. And that's where they found those. And so it was a jurisdictional issue with me too because my daughter went missing in Rosebud. Her car was found in Bighorn and her body was found in Rosebud County. So we had a lot of jurisdictional issues there who had jurisdictional this and that. But when it come right down to it, FBI had the whole, whole thing. Um, 
So where I'm at in today is speaking on behalf of my daughter and all the all the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. But I don't discriminate. Um, I also bring in the men too. Um, I think they're they're just as important because in God's eyes we're all equal. Um, thank you. As I mentioned earlier, I'm, I work with the Healing Hearts on our reservation, and um, I don't really have a whole lot to share other than you know the fact that I believe that this has been going on for for a number of years. You know, with our our young women, our Indigenous women, um, all across the United States, um, I believe this has been happening, and it wasn't until just recently that you know. We, there's been a lot of um, talk about it or advocating like by the mothers, uh, Melinda and, and Paula. I really commend both of you for, for you know, take, speaking up for your, your daughters because it takes a lot to do that, uh, a lot of courage. And um, I know it's hard to get up and, and stand up and talk, you know. Um, but as mothers, like Melinda mentioned, you know, um, if any of you are mothers, you know, you'll go out of your way to advocate for your daughters, for your children, not only your daughters, but your sons, when something happens. Um, and I guess I just feel I'm at a point where, you know, I will mention, you know, one of my cousins, uh, Letitia Joy Brin, who was murdered back in, I believe it was 90, was it 1990? Um, over in Minnesota, it was... Uh, being to death by her boyfriend at that time, and um, one of my aunts, who's her mother, Albina, had asked me to speak up um, at at one point in time, and it was really unexpected. But you know, I was I was glad to do it. I mean, to speak up and advocate because <clears throat> there's not only missing and murdered Indigenous, uh, you know, uh, things that are going on on our reservations. It's also the domestic violence and the sexual assaults that are happening. And there's a lot of that going on <clears throat> with our young people, you know. Not only young women, but men, you know, that's happening with our young men too. And so we have to speak up and, and start standing up for them and addressing this, you know, right now rather than just pushing it under the rug all the time. Um, I think these are important matters and, and it's hard, you know, to speak up. I mean, like, um, you know, with my own daughter, I, I mentioned her because, you know, I, I feel like I have to be her voice now. Um, she went through a sexual assault when she was 15 years old. And she asked, you know, when is somebody going to stand up for me? When is somebody going <clears> to <throat> speak up for me? Because, you know, it, it was traumatizing, you know, for the whole family. Um, it was traumatizing for not only me as a mother, but for her dad and you know, all of her siblings, um, my, her grandmothers, her aunties, you know, we were all affected by it. And like Melinda said, you know, you go through that same feeling of, you know, um, that morning looking for her, you know, she had been out drinking when this happened and um, I started to look for her that morning and it was like a nightmare. I mean, it was like trying to find her and then I ran into a cop down in Busby, you know, where I'm from. and. He said, uh, I said, I'm looking for my daughter. And he said, what is her name? And I told him. And he said, yeah, there's a possible DUI. And that was another worry. It was like, oh my gosh, now, you know, I got to worry about her being out on 212, you know. And there's trucks that go through there. If anybody knows 212, you know, how dangerous that can be. And all I could do was pray, you know, um, in hopes of finding my daughter. Um, I swear I drove from Busby to Harden to... Um, Kirby, Lane Deer, and then all the way to Ashland, and then back home, all within, I don't know, it just seemed like a couple hours maybe, and I messaged all her friends, you know, um, pretty much what Melinda said, you know, you'll go to any lengths to look for your kids. Um, I asked all her friends, um, I called around um, until, I, until finally the phone rang. I mean, I prayed almost all day today. And finally, you know, um, 
the uh, person from Labrie said she was down there, and I said, can you keep her there? And anyway, we went through that whole process, but it's almost the same thing, you know. But, you know, my daughter is alive, you know, and she's still going through, you know, the healing process. And it's still a healing process for all of us because we have to go through it together. Um, but like I said, you know, the, it, there's a lot that happens everywhere, even off the reservations, and it, it, it impacts everybody, even the communities. And I'm just glad that, you know, Miles City, you know, I mean, you're, you're an hour and a half away from our reservations, and I'm glad that you guys are taking an interest in, in learning more because it's not just Native communities, you know, it's all, you know, all the different cultures. Um, that this is affecting now. So um, I just wanted to share that much. I mean, I believe, you know, um, we need to start speaking up and um, addressing this issue, you know. Thank you. Hi, I'm Paula. <clears throat> I'm from the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. Um, my daughter was 14 when we found her. We, we also reported her missing. I was also told, did you check her friend's house? Did you check? Maybe she's got a new boyfriend. Did, have you checked there? You know, if I would have checked there, I wouldn't be reaching out for help. But they brushed us aside like they didn't want to help us. Um, so, I went to Crow. I re I can't remember what day I filed filed her missing. I went to the neighboring reservation and reported her missing there because I got nowhere with my with the cops on my tribe. So I went to Crow. I filled out missing persons report and I thought, okay, all right, it's cool. Somebody's helping me look for her because well, we looked everywhere. We went to Billings, we looked, mall, everywhere she, I would think she would go. Um, we checked Lodge Grass, Crow, Lane Deer, Busby, even Sheridan. When we went to, Sher came, went to Sheridan, we even looked for her there. When last time I seen her was December 7th. She left with one of her friends to go to open gym. Come to find out later, there was no open gym. So I think they were planning a party. So, then that's when I, a week later, I, that's when I filed in Crow. And then I filed, finally came to Langdeer and filed. And then, um, we just kept looking for her. My sister-in-law put it on all the online yard sales. We got really worried when we didn't see no activity in her Facebook or her Snapchat. So then I knew something was wrong. So from the day I reported her missing on the 7th, no, I seen her on 7th, the day I reported her missing was that Saturday, because that was a Friday, to the day we found her. It took 21 days. We They finally put her in the system maybe about like three days before we found her. They said she didn't qualify for an Amber Alert. I don't know what the qualifications were to meet that Amber Alert, but she, I guess she didn't meet them, so they didn't put out an Amber Alert for her. So I think when they did the alert, it was only good for 24 hours. And after that, it was canceled. And so they told us to put a search party together. So we, the 28th is when we put that party search party together. I wasn't allowed to go outside. I had to stay indoors. So they checked both sides of 212. They split them up and checked both sides of 212. Melinda was there. She, I know she had a hard time. She broke, had a breakdown out there. I had to comfort her, talk to her, and she continued on. 
and they were trying to call it quits early because it was getting dark. But my husband said, I'm going to keep looking. So they kept looking. They start going closer to closer to this house. And then they finally called all of us in. And we're like, well, what's going on? How come, how come we're not still searching? And they called me and my husband aside in the other room and they told us they found her at the house. I told the cops to go and look for her at. Where they found her, you could see her. It's not even very far from the front door. I don't know how they could have missed her. I don't even know how long she was laying out there. She had to continue laying out there for another night because it was getting dark. And then they came from Billings. There was like five, six trucks that came from Billings in a suburban and went out there. Well, we spent the night out there too. We went and made a bonfire at um, the Blue Tin Hall out there. That's when it was the snow getting cold. I can't say she didn't freeze because that was the first snow. But we camped, made a campfire out there and we waited for them the next morning to come get my girl. And they brought her to the mud hall, the muddy hall. And they said I identified her in a <coughs> newspaper. I didn't get to identify her. So I wasn't sure if it was her, but it was her. And they told me there was no foul play. There's no foul play. I haven't even heard anything from them since then. Nobody's even come to contact me. Nothing. I don't even know what's going on. There's no communication between us. They haven't asked me anything. They haven't kept in touch with me, so I don't even know where the investigation is going, if there's even one. So then, like Melinda, we started doing walks for her too. We did the first one, New Year's Eve. We did the second one on her birthday. And that's how I knew that something was wrong too. She wasn't there for my birthday. She wasn't there for Christmas. And she wasn't there for her birthday. The second walk we did was on her birthday. And the third walk we did was on Valentine's Day. I'm going to do four walks. The fourth one is going to be when it warms up. But it's like what Melinda said, it's not just for our daughters, it's for everybody. For all of them that murdered and missing. So, you know, if you're young, let somebody know where you're at. It don't have to be your mom. Let it be your friends. Let somebody know where you're at. If you're in trouble, moms, moms care enough. You can't do no wrong. You can't do nothing wrong. Let somebody know where you're at at all times. If you're scared to go home, go to a friend's house. But let somebody know where you're at. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bailey. I think I first noticed something was weird. Um, you know, when I was in Gillette with my mom, you know, rich boom town, mostly white, and you guys are familiar, I'm sure. Um, it seemed like every weekend I was going to weddings and baby showers and baptisms, but when I was in Langer with my dad or in Ashland with my dad, um, it was funerals, it was funeral, it was funeral, it was funeral, funeral. And I think some 
it really hit me hard. I think that was around 15, the murder Melinda talked about, where three men sexually assaulted and murdered, dismembered, and set on fire um, that woman. Um, one of those men, the young man, was um, my brother's first cousin, his best friend. And it took me a really long time to not only process someone I knew, someone I had, had countless hours of contact with, could even be capable of that. I remember when it happened. I mean, if he had never killed himself, I don't think anybody would have ever been charged with that murder. I remember those weeks right after it happened, I couldn't believe no one would come forward. I mean, this happened in front of so many countless people and not one person came forward. If he hadn't killed himself, that would have been just one more name on the list. And um, I remember when Hannah went missing, I remember those walks. Um, I was, I'm Hannah's age, and I had a baby that was Hannah's age, and um, I remember really clearly understanding that if that had happened to me and Gillette, that my mom wouldn't have had to put in work to get justice for me. Someone would still be in, you know, serving life in Wyoming's penitentiary if that had happened to me, but she had to fight to get someone to even care, to even get a news camera out there. And um, then a few years after that, um, my brother's best friend, the woman I think he would have ended up marrying, um, was driving home from college in South Dakota and on Highway 212, which is a great killer of Native women, um, she was hit by a drunk driver, a white guy, and he was given probation. So um, that happened on his birthday, just to seal that deal, just as traumatic as it could have been. And then in 2017, November 2017, we got a call in the middle of the night that um, Ozzy had been life flighted, flighted to Billings. He had traumatic brain injury. We had no idea what had happened. Um, when we got to the hospital, um, there was the start of what, probably a 13-hour surgery where we learned he had over 40 fractures in his skull. Um, I don't think I've ever seen exhaustion the way that those surgeons looked after that surgery. Um, he ended up being on life support for four days. They actually kept him on life support that day extra because he would have also died on my brother's birthday. And uh, we did end up you know, getting justice, but just like she talked about, the prosecutor's office wouldn't take our calls. They wouldn't take the calls from his mother, from his father. I still, we still to this day don't know exactly what happened. We have, you know, we have, we know rumors, but there's rumors from that he laid outside for 40 minutes and his girlfriend was involved, which, you know, is probably not true to, you know, millions of different things. It turned, it ended up being a 23-year-old Northern Cheyenne man who did it. He found a trampoline pool in Ozzy's front yard, got him outside after they had had a disagreement at a party. It was hours later they had gone to bed. Ozzy went outside and he was attacked with a trampoline pole that was found in his yard. And I had a feeling when they charged this man with second degree murder, that that was gonna be a bargaining chip because it probably wasn't second degree murder. Um, it was voluntary manslaughter. I studied criminal justice. I feel pretty confident saying what he committed was voluntary manslaughter. We actually learned in the newspaper that he pled down to involuntary manslaughter, which is what you would be charged with if you drove drunk and hit someone and killed them. I think that picking up a trampoline pole and bashing someone in the head you know, 20 times is voluntary. Um, Federal sentencing guidelines, um, the prosecutor recommended four years. Still won't return our call, still have no idea what happened. Like I said, we learned about this in the newspaper. Um, you know, these are just, I do work in mental health and I can't possibly express to you the amount of trauma. Um, you know, I see people disassociate from these kind of events all the time. I think, you know, my, my brothers who are native, to see the difference between my life and their lives, it's just palpable. And you know, the jurisdictional things used to be funny to me when I was really young, because it's like, I could drink underage on the reservation, and if the county cops didn't show up to pick me up, they had to let me go. But I didn't, you know, process until years later, well, if I had been a white man and I had beat a native woman, that's exactly what would have happened. You know, it's the same jurisdictional issue. Um, and yeah, I would just really like to thank you guys. I mean, I can't even imagine being up here with what you've been through and you know I wouldn't I wouldn't know about MMIW if it wasn't for your work so I just want to thank you guys so much. I'm not as I'm not as well spoken as these ladies are practicing this so I um wrote a um <clears throat> excuse me 
the statement. Uh, from 2003 to 2019, uh, 10 murders uh, affected my life in some way. Uh, either I consult members of the victim's family, their friends or their co-workers, um, or I knew the murderer in some capacity, or I knew the victim. The murder which impacted me the most and completely crushed my life for a little bit uh, was finding that my nephew James Bryn, uh, who I helped raise, had uh, hurt another person to a point where uh, they had passed away from the injuries that he had caused. Uh, she was a homeless, native woman. I was only 12 when he was born. From the day my nephew was born, his life was just awful. Um, they say in Crow Way, you're, you're not supposed to fight over your children. Uh, none of the crows in his life listened, and he was fought over before he even left the hospital. His father and his family demanded he be named Isaiah, and his mother and my family called him James, and that was pretty much how his life went being pulled between us for whatever reason at the time. Um, you know, you're, you're only 12 years old, there's only so much you can do in those situations. Uh, and I did everything that I could to protect him. I got an after school job to uh, provide for him. And I, I just had to sit back and watch and see what all of these adults were doing to him. And it wasn't enough as much as I did, it wasn't enough to keep him from becoming really angry and violent. <laughs> Even after the crime that he committed, um, I still love him. As I will always love my nephew. And I. Uh, He's, he's in prison. He's going to be in prison for about 10 years. Um, he's also been implicated in a, a, a dismemberment case. I don't know that uh, he's, he's been convicted of that yet. Um, he'll eventually need to reintegrate into society, and so um, I'll, I want to be the person to help him. <coughs> uh, it just depends on if he's, he's willing to follow the rules at that time. Um, <coughs> to me, all of, all of these senseless uh, killings, they have to stop. And it's really up to supportive communities like Mild City. It's up to supportive communities like Billings. Um, and I've seen a lot of support come out of um, Northern Cheyenne country. They're, they're doing a lot of work, grassroots work, um, to try and address some of the problems that uh, cause this. <laughs> you might want to turn it off. <laughs> um, You know, I don't know if he'll end up being charged with that second crime and just be in prison for the rest of his life. But all of the work that I'm doing in my various capacities is to not only, you know, create a better environment for him, but, you know, all of the remaining survivors of, of everything that has gone into MMIW. <clears throat> My name is Martina Minigan Dia. Sorry. <laughs> but I work for the Montana Native Women's Coalition in Billings. And I just kind of want to tell you a story. My supervisor is a storyteller. She talks about this one lady that she helped in a domestic violence um, case that my supervisor is a prosecutor. She's an attorney. She talks about um, this lady was, and I'm only telling you guys this, you know, to people that work in that field, or you're a college student, if you're a nurse or a doctor, but she said this lady was in a domestic violence uh, relationship, and then she um, 
he really hurt her one time. So he he left her and he's you know they left her on the floor. So she finally talked him into calling the ambulance. The ambulance came after her. When the ambulance asked her what happened, she told them a story. They take her to the emergency room. The emergency room people asked her what happened. Told them a different story. Doctor came in. Doctor asked her what happened. She told him, him or her a different story. But she was wanting help. She was hoping that these three people, the medical, the emergency room, the doctor would collaborate and realize that she needed help. And the only reason I tell that story is because, you know, you guys are in Miles City, you guys go through the same, you know, issues we go through on the Native American reservations, whether it's Blackfeet, you know, Fort Peck, or Northern Cheyenne, or Crow. But, you know, just kind of reach out to people if you see them. You know, Mount City, we just really thank you guys for inviting us to come and talk about our issues here because you're like right in the middle of North Dakota and Montana. People stop here, they go to Walmart. Maybe you'll see one of our sisters there What that needs help, you know. Ask. You know, are you okay? She tells you, tries to tell you a story, listen. She needs help whether it's domestic violence, human trafficking, sexual assault. We need help. We want to help each other, and that's why we're here. We just really appreciate the community for inviting us. Did any of our panelists have anything more they'd like to say about the past, or do we want to open up the floor for any questions that folks may have? It's up to my panel. Okay. Do we have any questions from the audience that you would like to address any members of our panel before we move on? Um, first of all, thank you all for being the brave women that you are. I think you've taught everyone in this room something about being a brave woman tonight. I really appreciate you coming. The question I have is I do work on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation, and I was wondering, is there anything similar that that reservation has started to help their sisters? Like to the other communities? Or? Is there something similar to what you have obviously made very resourceful for your community. Um, do you know of anything that the Fort Peck Reservation is doing that's similar to what you're doing? Um, the answer to that question would be um, when I was in Helena for the um, House Bill 21 Act, um, I noticed that the Grace's Reservation already got the resolution going up there on that. Um, for House Bill 21. Um, you guys are way ahead of us. Uh, us guys are just now starting, um, trying to bring it to the council to get it approved on our reservation. Um, I was very impressed with, um, your, with that reservation up there. Um, they're kind of like one step ahead of us, so I kind of like to keep in touch with them up there because it gives me opportunity to um, help help my community members in Langer also. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for all your stories. <laughs> Pretty hard to render. Um, in conjunction with what she just mentioned, I noticed I talked I saw Mr. Romy on TV on Sunday and he stated that <coughs> one of the problems is data, the collection of data. And I'm wondering if anybody has worked on getting you, you know, set up so there's a central system where you can feed into and be accessible. Do you know? I also had that. I also had that um, asked to me a couple of times, and so um, there wasn't really a database that I could go to and stuff. So on our reservation, so I just went ahead and got on Facebook and asked the community members if they wanted to um, 
mentioned their loved ones and stuff. It's not really a database, but it was something for me to go on. And on that list, I came up with um, 52 women that were missing or murdered. Um, this goes back to 19... I think the, 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 the lowest, I mean, the date on it was 1956 to current... Um, there was 52 women that were on that um, list for missing and murdered. Um, on the men's side, it was like 42 men that was that have been missing and murdered on a reservation also. And so that's what got me um, talking about, because I, I, I never did really bring men into my conversations until that came in, came in. And I was just like blown away, like how 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 many there is. That's almost like a hundred hundred people, men and women, that that's been missing or murdered on a reservation. And I don't know if um, how many of those have ever been into a database. I, I just don't know. So that's what House Bill twenty one is consist of is um, to get that database going. So we need to call Helena, 444, yeah. 4800, and say yes. Yes, you pre approve House Bill 21. Thank and you. And for the database. Okay, good. You need to do that. Thank you. Any other audience members that would like to ask a question? Absolutely. I appreciate the comments that you ladies are making. The one thing that I would like to tell you is I know it's intimidating sometimes to come in front of us, but the most powerful testimony we get is from people who have lived the story you're telling. So if, if you, if it, if it bothers you to come talk to us, tell us the story. I'm talking because I'm in a state legislature, so we want to hear this. So please come, come tell us your story. It's powerful. Any other comments? Questions? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, also, thank you. Oh, you're on. Uh, thank you for sharing what you've shared this evening. Uh, I have two reactions when I, when I hear these stories. One is, uh, how can our communities be more supportive of people who've gone through this? But the other big issue is, how can this be prevented? Uh, and I'm wondering if there are any uh, efforts going on in my city, for that matter, uh, in our school systems or elsewhere to teach people how to deal with anger management or respect for women. Uh, you mentioned that they're missing and, and murdered men as well, but, uh, but especially with women. I just shudder to think that, that there are men out there who have so little respect for women that they are willing to use violence uh, for any reason whatsoever. So I'm wondering if, if anyone has started looking for ways to uh, do preventive things um, on your reservation communities as well. I think, <clears throat> well, on the Northern Chan Reservation, one of the, the things that we've started to do within the Healing Hearts and then along with Melinda and our law enforcement is going out into the schools. Um, we're going out and doing prevention and education with the students there. Um, the last one we did was in at Lane Deer High School and I thought it was very effective with the high school students. Um, there was a lot of um, issues that were brought out. Melinda was able to share her story a little bit and, and let the students know, you know, like what Paula was seeing. If any of there's any young people out there, you know, let someone know where you're at, and um, you know because if you go missing, you know the parents or, or the whoever the community is going to be out there looking, you know, trying to find out where you know where you're at, and it's just it's just scary for the whole community. But those are some of the you know ways that we're um, trying to you know look at as far as uh, doing prevention and education in that area, and then also. With the walks that Melinda's having, I think you know that's bringing out that community awareness. So those are some of the ways. Along with that, um, 
I just kind of want to say, you know, um, a lot of it has to do with the police department and named her. Um, the problem with our reservation is that these cops all come onto our reservation and they can leave, that they sign lease <coughs> and agreements for three months, six months, a year. And they come to our reservation and they see that we're a community that don't have no place to go for like movies. There ain't really nothing there. Um, so they don't like to stay around in our communities very long. Um, so when something happens, they get detailed out. New people will come in. And it's really hard for their community members and, and lame there because we got such a high rate of turnaround for the police department over there that um, when something like this way happens, they, they're they just here, then they're gone. And when it's time to go to court, they either don't want to come back, and so the person mostly gets away with it and stuff. And another problem that we had to have, have on our, our reservation is that Crow Reservation don't have no money to support, keep their um, jailhouse open. So their um, inmates are coming to Lander and occupying our jail. So a lot of people that should be in jail are getting out and walking free um, because of there's no place to put, put these people in there. But I just now read in a newspaper the other day that that um, Hardin's going to open up that um, detention center over there and that our tribe is co, co cooperating or whatever to get um, our jail free for the people that need to be in our jails too. Um, I just kind of wanted to mention that too because the jail has a lot, I mean, it has a lot to do with who's in jail and who ain't in jail and stuff. So I'm kind of glad that that's going on, um, opening up for, for them over there. That way the people that need to be in jail will be in jail. <laughs> so, uh, as far as prevention goes, I think a lot of people are still examining uh, exactly how to go about preventative measures, and they're coming at it from a lot of angles. Uh, for myself, um, I approached the Billing City Council to create a City to Tribe um, Commission. Wait, not loud enough? Okay. <laughs> um, to hopefully begin examining exactly how we can go about those preventative measures. Um, using various uh, resources in buildings like uh, CASA, which is, provides guardian app items for children in foster care, um, through whatever kind of citizens' police work is available. You know, just there's various options, um, and then trauma uh, trauma op uh, treatment options. There's probably a lot of grief counseling needs to take place too. So, trying to figure out how to go about uh, tailoring that to make it tribal uh, specific. So that's a whole other endeavor. Um, and then this is just kind of like my personal take on it, but I'm one of those people that thinks poetry is going to save the world. <laughs> so I'm working with, um, currently exploring with Barry Billings Area Literary Arts to um, create a uh, program in Title I schools, which see a large indigenous population. Um, to foster kind of um, poetry education. Because what I've found through poetry is you, you tend to process your trauma that way. Um, so I think it would be really beneficial for childhood development to be able to have that as an option and a consistent option. It was an option, um, but the funding for it was, was cut. And so that just needs to be reestablished. So that's kind of a preventative measure I'm looking at. And then, <coughs> I'm really pushing everybody in the world, actually, to start their own community garden. <laughs> I think that would be a really good way to reestablish community um, and then foster kind of that interconnectedness that we have, not only with each other, but with nature. And so I think that would be a good preventative measure. 
because then we'd be a lot more um, connected with one another. And we'd be aware of where everybody is at, you know, emotionally or spiritually. And so, yeah, that's, that's my ideas on that. <laughs> I actually love that you asked how to prevent it because I think, you know, indigenous women have worked so hard to get this issue known that now that we see, you know, media and politicians really grabbing a hold of it, I think we've, we fall so easily into this tough on crime notion. And a lot of those bills to me sound like we're going to put a lot of native men in prison. Yeah, we're going to send them to federal prison. And I think that that completely ignores the fact, you know, I don't necessarily want who killed my brother to suffer. I want it to not have happened. And I think that, you know, prevention is the answer. Um, I think that what's going to happen is we're going to see a lot of bills coming through and passing, and they're, you know, great, you know, they're good bipartisan bills. Both sides love these bills. And what I see, though, is a federal government asking for more money when they're not effective with the money that they have. I hear words like special prosecutors. Well, you already have a prosecutor, and they're not choosing to prosecute 70% of the cases that get put on their desk. And that's just kind of the way the game goes. I don't think prosecutors are inherently evil people, but I think that they're incredibly powerful people. And when we set up a system that it's not worth prosecuting cases unless you can, it's not worth spending our money to do it. It's not worth, you know, to them, it's not worth their good prosecution record to take those cases. And I think really the answer to me lies in strengthening indigenous tribal courts and to decolonize that, that tribal justice system. I think there's a lot of tribes in America that have really great restorative justice models. That's kind of a buzzword, but you know, some of these murders might not have the evidence that it's ever gonna get through court and get a conviction, but I don't think that means that that case doesn't matter and it should be ignored. I think that there's a lot of great models out there that would allow for restorative justice, that would you know, let sexual assault um, survivors get access to services, to, um, Like I said, I just, I hear these bills coming through, and I don't think that they're all bad bills. I love, you know, I'm a sociologist, so I'm here for all data collection. I, I love data collection. But I also love um, addiction treatment. Let's be real, Medicaid expansion is gonna save indigenous women. I, I think that that's really clear. I think that when we have kids that aren't shuffled through the foster care system and develop attachment disorders and then have to use to cope with that trauma themselves. I mean, these murderers, I think that a lot of times it's painted as like, you know, this Ted Bundy truck driver, you know, going around, and that might be the case in some instances, but to me, it's traumatized people generationally spreading that trauma, and I think to really empower those community justice programs is really gonna be the answer, because I think that some of these bills really ignore the fact that the federal government is a perpetrator of violence on reservations that police are perpetrators of violence on reservations. And I think that really the answer, like I said, is gonna be in the strengthening of tribal justice and really changing that model and what it looks like. Uh, thank you, Bailey. I think that uh, goes ahead and brings us into our next discussion of what are we doing in the present. And I know we've already talked a little bit about some of the programs that are happening right now. I did want to go ahead and acknowledge Miles City is fortunate tonight to have our local House District Representative Kenneth Comlin from House District 38 here this evening. Kenneth, would you mind sharing with us the progress of the various bills that the Native Caucus has put forward since we're at Transmittal Break? Do you have a moment? I don't kind of put you on the spot. So we'll go ahead and we'll welcome our representation. Let's see what we're doing in the legislature right now. Well, uh, I'm saw now. Okay. Um, I'm fortunate in that I've had several friends from the Native American Caucus in Helena. And uh, the stories that you're telling, I was not in the committees to hear them, but I do know, most of you will know a lady named Ray Peppers. Ray's a good friend of mine. And she will tell me, when up is up and down is down. She's not at least bit afraid to express her opinion, and I'm glad for that. So the bill that, that you're talking about, Hannah's bill, um, didn't get the, the publicity and the, the hearing that it probably should have gotten. Uh, I, I'm in appropriations, and so really all I see is the money side of it, but uh, there was not a lot of talk about that bill. But when you stand up there and you talk about it, that's a, that's a story that would have really sold Hannah's had we, had we had the opportunity to hear that. We've also got other bills that are going through 
what happens oftentimes when you have several bills that come in with basically have the same idea behind them? They tend to get put together in one or two bills because we're also limited on time and we're limited on money. I'm not, I'm not making excuses, I'm just telling you the way that it is. So the uh, bill that is currently going through, I believe it's House Bill 54, I think it is, uh, passed through the House powerfully. Very, very bipartisan bill. So I think that that one's going to do just fine. Hannah's story, uh, I hope that it makes it through as well also, but if you have the opportunity to come up and talk to the Senate, that's, that's where the story needs to be told now is in the Senate. Uh, and that's where 54 will be also, because we had to pass that over by Saturday. So they're both in the Senate. The Senate does things a little differently than the House does. But I, I think that those will probably both make it through. I, I hope that they do. Because there's some things that we just need to know about. And the if you think that indigenous uh, the, the women that are getting that are missing and, and have been killed is not being talked about, you're not right, because that is a topic of conversation that's going around in the halls of the House right now. And it's being very well received up there as far as wanting to do something about it. So just don't give up. <laughs> keep keep fighting for your good fight. What is 54? Um, it's, it has, well, he's asking what House Bill 54 does. It has to do with, it, with the missing and murdered indigenous women. And it's primarily women that we are talking about up there. You have, you have a couple of pretty good spokesmen, people, and, uh, and Ray, and uh, a couple of others that are up there. Uh, there. There's a young man named Running Wolf. Do you know him? Do you guys, he is a very powerful, articulate young man. And, and he will do a lot of good for your cause up there. He's, he's, a, he's obviously got the respect of the people up there. And that's, that's a challenge sometimes is to get people's respect up there. So he's got it. <coughs> And I know we had quite a few um, of our local guests. You have spoken in Helena on behalf of some of these important bills. Would any of you like to share what maybe some of the meat and potatoes are, these bones, what bills, what they will do to help this crisis? Would anybody like to speak to that about what is being done on the legislative level? Because I know there was one about uh, database collectioning as well as breaking down some of the barriers between um, uh, local law enforcement, tribal law enforcement. I didn't know if anybody wanted to speak on that. No, that's okay. For if, you, if you are interested in reading um, what is a part of those bills, we um, did include a handout here for, for all of our guests this evening so you can read up on um, some of those barriers that these bills uh, go ahead and take down. Um, and then I also know there is. I might also tell you how to get to the place where you can read about these bills. Oh, it's on the handout. Okay, leg.mt.gov. Yeah, that's okay, okay. <laughs> that's, that gives you all the information that you need. Back my seatmate here is looking it up right now. <laughs> I always hate having to write down web links when I have a presentation, so we always include everything for people. Um, so I guess. Um, yeah, oh, we do have somebody. Yes, please. If you guys are interested in more of the legislative side of what you can do, I would definitely recommend. There's a great nonprofit in Billings called Western Native Voice, or yeah, Western Native Voice. Um, they do a really great job of keeping track of when bills are coming up, what's in them. Um, they do a great job of organizing. If you ever want to travel to speak on behalf of them, they can help you with that. And they have organizers on every reservation too. So it's Western Native Voice. They they have a Facebook and a website. Wonderful, thank you. Um, yes, we were asking, um, and I should I should allow her to properly introduce ourselves. One more member of our panel has arrived. Um, we were talking about what the bills contain in Helena that have recently been passed through the legislature, what those bills do for Indian country. Good evening. Sorry, I'm late. I had some car trouble, but um, I'm here. 
My name is Renalia Whiteman Pena. I'm the president of the Northern Cheyenne Tribe, and I'm a very strong advocate um, in MIW. And um, I became, well, I guess um, we, I became really involved when um, when we lost Hannah, when we had this incident of when one day seeing her, spending the whole evening with her, and the next day she was missing. And within two days we were doing a search party looking for her. Five days later, we find her and she's deceased. And um, not only that one, but we also, I also was very active in Henny Scott when she went missing. And um, <clears throat> three weeks, 21 days later, you know, she was missing her mom. You know, we were questioning, she was questioning, trying to get some help and finding, uh, trying to find resources to help her in locating her daughter. And um, 21 days later, uh, she was found. It took four hours when the law enforcement became involved, the FBI became involved. It took them four hours to find her after 21 days of being missing. So, um, the advocate, I mean, uh, being proactive in MMIW don't just span from um, these two individuals. But these are the movement that has pushed us to where we are today. Not only with, um, not only in, on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, but also all over Indian country. You see MMIW being a very active proactive movement because there are people that have been missing way too long. And when you talk about MMIW, I also would like to mention that there are there is also Native American men that have are murdered and missing. And um, that we also need to begin to express our uh, express about these men that have been missing also. But I would like to touch a little bit about the, um, the bills that are up uh, in the Senate right now. Okay, um, these House Bill 21, Hannah's Act, is a bill that will enact, um, assign an investigator to missing uh, and murdered women in a timely manner, you know? Um, and because when you, when most of the, I mean, I don't have the data with me, but if you look at the data of missing and murdered indigenous women, you would be surprised at the alarming rate that it's, and it's still climbing, you know, at the count in the data about how many missing and murdered indigenous women have been um, accounted for on this data, but yet some still not found. Some are still missing, you know, murders gone uh, uh, by the wayside. But this also starts from way back, years ago. You know, it doesn't just start from, from recent uh, murders. It starts way back, but no one ever really um, collected data. No one ever really researched it. No one ever really, it, never, it wasn't brought to a spotlight. But it never left the family's hearts of these individuals that have been missing for quite a while, missing or murdered. The families that have experienced these, it has never left their, their hearts because there has not been justice served in those that have been murdered and missing. But when, when these, um, these, um, House bills that are on the floor right now, that is a great impact for Native women because these will be designed and it'll be law to abide by, to, to have a better response in finding those that have gone murdered and missing. And you know, House Bill 54, it allows, it allows, um, it allows pe um, them to react within two hours, I think, for juveniles. Two hours. Two hours for anyone 17 years and younger. And for if they're 
considered missing. For 18 and over, it's eight hours. And for, for the law enforcement to become involved when there is a missing Native American woman or uh, children <coughs> because of the responses that was given um, to these young mothers that had lost their children, especially when we went looking for Hannah. And the responses that were given and saying, oh, she might be out and about for during the powwow. Well, when you see a missing, I mean, when you see a missing uh, non-native person off the reservation go missing, you have somebody within 24 hours searching for those individuals. Either searching or it's public information out there where Native American women should have the equal opportunity, just like anyone else, to be able to have the same response. And with that, when we went looking for Hannah, and we were told, you know, that she might be out partying, she might be out with a friend, she might be out doing something, and she might return after the powwow. Okay, well, even in actuality, she didn't return. She didn't return home to her 10-month-old son. The only way she returned home was in the bag, which is sad. Which is very sad. Because of the decomposition of her body, there was no way of telling her, holding her, saying her goodbyes from the family, from her loved ones, anything. Because she came home, and she, we, when she was found, she, she was brought home in her, the bag that they put them in, and then in a coffin, which was sealed. So you know, if, 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 if and maybe, <coughs> the response was within 24 hours, she might have been found alive, or she might have been found in a better condition that she was found in. So when you think about that, these are laws that will protect and hopefully help our Native American women and families in finding them sooner alive or even bringing closure to them in a better manner. Because far too long this has gone on and I can go way back. I don't know how much time I have, but I can go way back knowing that there had been missing and murdered women that no cases have been solved for today. Um, When, when um, Paula began to search for her daughter, you know, if there was a 24-hour response, well, in her case, if there was a two-hour response, where she received the last phone call talking to her daughter, if there was a two-hour response, they probably would have found her daughter alive. But because in the lap, of um, response in from Northern Cheyenne law enforcement to Crow law enforcement or you know whatever the path it was because of the lack of res quick response in that you know she wasn't found until 21 days later so you know these kind of things these laws will help protect our Native American women and children. I, I see there is a potential jurisdictional issue here because according to House Bill 54, I'm just reading, the state legislature has no authority to require either federal or tribal governments to accept this. They can encourage it, 
but because you're independent nations, they can't force that. And I sure hope that that you women and uh, and men in your tribes as well really push uh, your tribal government to to accept this in the tribes as well, because that really would have helped a lot. Two hours. <coughs> No, it's it's just inexcusable that these these moms were left for days without uh, having anybody actively searching. Um, just to answer your question, we have already passed a resolution on our reservation Excellent. in our council that has touched these bills. So we're on top of that. Excellent. Yeah. Nice. So it is. It is enacted as soon as it passes on the Senate floor, and it's good to. It's still good to go on our floor, you know. You know, we still. It, 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 they've already put it, enacted it with some certain teenagers that have gone missing, or some, you know, anyone that has gone missing so far from this date, from that date to now, they've already. They're already on it. The police department is on it. They. We have a chat line. We have a rescue um, rescue uh, team that have gotten together of local people, tribal people, non-tribal, non but they've gotten together and they've um, created a rescue team and also a chat line. So they're on it. We're on it already. You know, so we don't really have, I mean, we have to wait for these laws to be enacted, but we also have already implemented in tribal government. So a resolution has already been passed on that. So that part is, you know, and, then, and I suggest that other tribes do it as soon as possible. So that way when it becomes law, it is already law in the resolution. So, you know, these laws will help protect our Native American um, women and children. They'll help them, help these families you know, because no one's exempt from it. No one is. You know, I have a, we have a missing, uh, or she was found. We have a young lady. Her name was Denise Russell. Okay, she was walking on Highway 212. Is the last time anyone had ever seen her. In the summer months of, I think it was, I forgot what year, but um, she's, she was walking on on the 212 and who picked her up or who took her to her to the location that her body was found at like two or three months later this was in June so in sep I think it was in September she was found in another county um, off the reservation by a rancher a rancher found her. So with that, the only way they identified her was because of her clothing and a picture that she had in her back pocket of her mother and her. So to this day, her murder hasn't been, uh, there hasn't been no justice for that family. There hasn't been no justice for her. And she's, she's still listed as data. That's where she's at, her, she's at today. But that heartbreak for her family has never gone away. And she's always gonna be a uh, um, name mentioned on our reservation because she her murder has never been found. You know, so a lot of this, these laws are good for us because it does an impact and, and the impact that it has done is because of these mothers crying loud, not giving up these families out there that are have missing and murdered indigenous women and children. Because of crying loud, we're the voice of those that are still out there, those that are have not there hasn't been justice for them. So, you know, the horrific things that happen to these women, just like Ashley Loring, run, Loring run, Heavy Runner, she's still out there somewhere. 
her soul is still crying out, her spirit is still crying out because she's never been found. And for that, for justice to be served is what we want. But but there'll never be a justice that comes to, to be enough to satisfy the loss of a life. You know, I re when I was 17 years old, my sister got killed in a car wreck. Well, it was our 4th of July powwow, July 3rd. She was coming back into town. She was hit by a drunk driver and died instantly. And at the time, I was younger, but my older sisters talked to my mom, and they said, you know, you could file against him and for, you know, insurance or whatever. And my mom said, there will never be enough money that could justify my daughter's life or bring her back. And that, that right there, that's those kind of statements that are in their hearts. You know, everybody sitting here has a story. And in February 2017, my daughter got hit, my daughter and my niece, got hit just outside of Busby. They were killed, they were hit head on by a non-native, but he's from the community, married into the, a community member, or a tribal member. Hit head on and um, they died, both of them. They weren't killed instantly, but my da daughter died on the way to the hospital and my niece died at the hospital. So justice in that area, because he was a non-member <coughs> and because there was, he was a non-member and we, ha we didn't have jurisdiction over him. He's never been served, he's never been charged. So you know, these kind of things is what we go through. And not only that, you know, eight months later, I lost another daughter. So, these, and that had to do with a lot of things in Yellowstone County for her. And so just as you can, tr you can send somebody to trial, they can get years, whatever, but the justice that served will never bring their lives back, ever. So you know, these bills that are up there now, and I praise, uh, Ray Peppers, who is a community member and is very strong voice. And we back her 100% for her bills that she sends to, puts on the legislative. It's a lot of work. She does it, she does it from her heart. And she's put these bills, we've been fighting for these bills for a long time and how to present them but yet crying loud and being the voice of those that are out there that have not made it home. Those that have made it home, but murdered or, you know, in a way that should never happen to anyone. And you know, and it's not, I don't care what race you are, it should never happen to a person. Justice should be served one way or another. But we are their voice. We are their voice. And we were ready to represent them. Thank you. Thank you, Tribal President. Um, as we're wrapping up our evening, um, I, I would like to ask the panel members to speak on what the future holds. What would you like to see with the future? What would you like to see with the future? There's a room full of people here today who want to know what we can do in the future if you have asks, or if you have dreams, or if you have wishes for what this crisis looks like in the future. I would ask if any panel members are willing to speak on that, and um, hopefully we can uh, leave this evening with direction and with hope and with plans for doing better in the future. So many panel members are available. I would love to hear your voices, as I'm sure the rest of the group would.
What I would like to see for the future is, you know, like Rene said, a quick response. You know, I believe my daughter would have been found alive if it was in place. Um, when I reported her missing in Crow, her report just sat on somebody's desk that was out on vacation. Nobody was looking for her in Crow. And when he came back from his vacation, we had already found her. And he sat there and he seen that report. And he just cried. And so what I want is communication with all, everybody, whoever's involved. I want communication with the police station, with the FBI, with the parents, with the families, everybody that's involved. I want communication so everybody will be on the same page. And a quick response. Thank you. Um, but I would like to see, well, I've been trying to do my part, um, I've been going to the schools and I've been, um, letting the kids know how it feels on the mother's side to lose their loved, their loved ones, my daughter, how their parents would feel. Um, I also try to bring awareness to them to let them know, um, what they can do. Always tell somebody where they're going, what they're doing. And if I really stress it, but nowadays, like on Facebook page, if, if you're going to meet somebody for the very first time and they tell you, don't tell nobody, you, you make darn sure you tell somebody. And that's my biggest goal is to let, the, um, let my community, um, the children know what to look for to keep themselves safe. Thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think what I would like to see is just more, uh, like we mentioned before, prevention um, and education in the schools and community awareness. Um, I would also like to see what Paula mentioned, um, that quicker response, um, especially with our younger, our younger ones, because um, we should have Amber alerts and stuff like that on the reservations right off the bat when you know we hear of a um, younger age person or a teenager you know has gone missing. We should that should be put out right away. Um, and I, I guess I forgot to mention and. I told my nephew that I would mention it. Um, I had a, she would be kind of like my granddaughter in her Cheyenne way. Um, but she, I guess in the white way, she would be considered, you know, like a, a great niece. Um, but I consider her a granddaughter. Um, she, I think it was a year ago, um, she was playing outside at Muddy. And I don't know if some of you remember that. Yeah. But she was, uh, her and another little girl were taken, um, they were just playing outside. There was a lot of little kids that were playing outside. And her dad was on the phone with my brother. And he said he just turned away for like two minutes, you know, had his back turned and told, told his daughters, you know, not to go far. Um, but when he turned away, um, turned back around, he asked his younger daughter, you know, where's your sister? And she was gone, just like that. And uh, the mother and my nephew were frantically looking for her around the muddy cluster area, you know, asking where she was, trying to find her. She was nowhere to be found. Um, they called the police, um, and then um, not not too, I don't know how long, maybe an hour, 45 minutes. Well, he said it felt like a long time anyway, just coming from him, but he said that they, um, this man had come off of 212 and picked those girls up, him and another little girl. The other little girl was a little bit older than her, and he tried to take off with them. And those girls were screaming and crying in the back. Um, he turned off, muddy turn off, and um, supposedly told them, you know, to be quiet or 
you know, he was going to stop and do something to them or, you know, something like that. But so they stopped the car, or he stopped the car and was hollering at them. And the older girl jerked my uh, granddaughter off with her. And just then a van was coming and picked them up. And uh, well, my my nephew was outside and his wife, that van told him, so are you looking for two little girls? And they said yes, that they were. And they got off of the van. So they were lucky, you know, to, to be found, you know, or so that nothing didn't happen to them. And like, you know, the many others out there, there was no justice, even though um, my granddaughter and this young lady um, pointed this man out in a, a line of um, photos. Um, you know, the FBI took over on that case. And it just seems like that happens a lot. I mean, you know, the feds come in and they take over and there's no justice for any of our victims. Or it doesn't seem like it. Um, so that's what I would like to see is, you know, a quicker response time, more education and awareness within our communities, and you know, more of these, you know, these mothers speaking out or the families speaking out and advocating at, at places like this, and and more collaboration, like with you know, their communities, the different communities. So that's what I like to see. <coughs> You know, um, what I'd like to see is our young ladies growing up and having a family or what they choose to be, education or whatever it might they might choose to be in life. Growing up and being a productive citizen, living their life and enjoying their children and grandchildren. That's what I'd like to see. But you know, we live in a world now where it's a whole different story. And um, let's see, um, about a week, two weeks ago, they had a um, thing up at the high school, Langer High School. And um, they asked if I would come up and speak to the young ladies. And so we went up there and it was, uh, the, the high school and part of the junior high, or the junior high and high school. And um, it was honoring the young ladies. So we were able to um, speak to the young ladies about the value of themselves, valuing themselves as young ladies. And I thought it was just going to be for the young ladies, but there was also the uh, young men there. So I did talk to the young men also and I just let them know what it's like to respect a woman or respect girls, respect a woman. And you know, we as Native Americans, we believe, you know, that the, the, I mean, it's, you guys, I mean, you guys probably believe the same thing, but if it wasn't for a woman, you know, each one of us wouldn't have life but women bring you into this world. And um, when we were able to speak to these young women and honor them, that, that uh, sense of self-worth was awesome. At the end of this presentation, we distributed roses to each one of them. And um, so this is a start. This is a start in the schools. And also, the young men, they're coming up with another um, presentation for the young men to value, value themselves and the importance that they are. And we're doing a, um, board of house, our board of house is bringing a presenter. And, and they're going to be going into the middle school first, I think healthy relationships, knowing um, what's healthy and what's not, you know, teaching them the things at a young, you know, younger, young age and the impact of bad choices. And though they're going to start with the middle school and the, middle, and the high school and the, and the tribal school. But these are things that are going to you know, prepare them 
because they're, you know, when you're that age, you know, it's a whole different ball game. Your thinking isn't, your, I mean, you can think far differently when, to when you're our age, you know. And that's what I reiterated to them, you know, when I was your age, I was probably just like you. <laughs> and um, thought I knew everything, you know. But getting them the education and awareness of what <coughs> is happening now is really what's important. So these are things that we're doing, you know, back home to empower our youth. And just like I told them, you know, I was your age before, but one of these days you may be where I am today. And so, with these things, you know, giving them the opportunity to value themselves and know that different choices in life can benefit them in, in different ways. So I, um, I, we speak, we speak to them over and over and over, so that way something might stick. You know, something that we say may stick and they, they'll grasp a hold of it and they will make better choices, they'll uh, live a lot longer, go a lot further, and be, help somebody else along the way. You know, so these are things that I, I mean, I would like, I, I can envision is seeing our young children live a lot longer and go a lot further. So with that, you know, we just, um, the education, the awareness, the communication, we're trying to bridge those gaps. Because as you see, there's been a lot of gaps and loopholes, but we're trying to bridge them and we're doing what whatever possible in making those come to reality. We've gotten the police department, not only from uh, our, we have two counties in the, on our reservation. So we've got um, two different county, two different reservations where we're coming together so that way when there's a response, if, if there's a response, you know, we wanna be on the same page not only that, the communication, the, the procedure that you take, we have a good networking page on our website, or it's uh, um, on, on Facebook, Northern Cheyenne Community Broadcasting. So when something goes on, it's on there. We have a media specialist that puts a lot of stuff on there, you know, whether it's jobs or, you know, it, it just a variety of things. But, but everybody goes to the uh, electronics, you know. So there's always stuff on there. And that's some of the procedures that we're working on is how to report a missing person, you know. How to, you know, and the, sometimes people don't really know how to go about doing it. But if we have it out there, getting people educated on it, more awareness, and communication, those are three aspects that would help benefit and move a lot further. So those are things we're working on, and I just pray and hope that we don't have to go and search for another person that, and in its more awareness, we bring opening, opening doors for the homeless in our tribal office, for the cold weather if they don't have somewhere to go, you know, we're taking our steps, you know, baby steps, but they'll make a great impact on a lot of this stuff. Educating our kids how to not go out alone, stay together. If you're going to go somewhere, tell somebody. And you don't, and you know how kids are. They're not going to tell your parents, oh, I'm here at partying at somebody's house or whatever. They're not going to say that. But make sure that somebody knows where you're at. If you're going to stay overnight with a friend and not are scared to go home, just make sure that somebody knows where you're at. 
that's the most important factor, whether you're young or whether you're old. It doesn't matter, just be aware. Again, would just really like to see tribal governments just really empowered and claiming that sovereignty. And I'd like to see tribal courts initiating, you know, kind of decolonized views on justice. Just because you can't have a burden of proof doesn't mean that there can't be some type of healing approach for both parties. I mean, I don't want her nephew to rot in prison any more than I want, you know, her daughter to never have justice. And I would love to see, you know, the federal government, instead of putting that money towards themselves, to put it towards these tribal governments. I want to see community, you know, indigenous-led grassroots organizations that are working towards nutrition and physical health and mental health, where people don't have to leave their communities to get that kind of help. I want to see tribal social services so well-funded that they're claiming every equal case that they can. I don't want to see any more Native kids lost into the foster care system in these border towns. And I know a lot of that you know, sounds like a utopia or maybe even a fantasy, but, you know, 10 years ago, when Hannah, you know, or even when Hannah went missing, um, to think that there would be so many pieces of legislation, le legislation both from the state and federal level that is addressing this issue, I mean, that was a fantasy. I passed a, a billboard that was MMIW on my way here, and I almost turned around because, I, you know, I couldn't believe it. I mean, that would have been 10 years ago. That would have been completely unheard of. So. You know, I'm really excited to see in the next 10 years what these, you know, indigenous-led grassroots efforts can really accomplish, and I think I just want to appreciate what they already have accomplished. So, I have a list. Um, <laughs> uh, this is actually a topic that a lot of my friends that are working on various projects in Billings have uh, brought to me and they, they always ask how they can help uh, the indigenous communities. So it's a topic that I've been exploring for quite a long time. Um, first and foremost, uh, just learn indigenous issues all the way from the I'm not your mascot thing to cultural appropriation to um, you name it. There's there's a lot of them. You can just begin there and, and be okay being comfortable, uncomfortable with the, the information. It's going to get uncomfortable. You're not going to know everything. You're going to get confused by it. So <clears throat> let's see. Is this, am I loud enough? <laughs> I'm getting over a chest cold. <laughs> um, I think befriending one another is really important. Um, a lot of times, especially in these situations, it's really hard to know how to approach one another just because it's such a sensitive topic. Um, just learning that approach and uh, being OK being uncomfortable in that approach, that's really important. Um, or you can help me with any of my projects. I'm always open to networking and <laughs> making new friends. <laughs> um, another good one that I'm really kind of advocating for right now because I've been, I've been going to a lot of indigenous events. I don't see a lot of um, the ladies community uh, participants at indigenous events. So I'm really encouraging if you ever see anything, be it I don't know, fried bread sale or, you know, Indian taco sale, whatever it is we're doing, um, and a walk, just go. It's a good way to learn the culture. It's a good way to learn the key players in the MMIW movement. Everybody's doing kind of their own thing. So it's, and it's, it can be fun. It's, it's a tragic thing to have to come together for. But I mean, we all have like a really good sense of humor. <laughs> and so I really enjoy, you know, getting to go and find support because it's difficult to go through. Um, one of the things that I'm finding is that a lot of the advocates out of Billings um, are hesitant to share our missing and murdered um, information for some reason, so they won't share it on social media. So I'd really encourage um, everybody to start sharing that whenever a new poster comes out or you know um, a cold case poster comes out. It's just a quick share. Um, Write your legislators and advocate for issues to be heard and taken seriously. Um, also give them feedback, you know, constructive feedback. Um, and then this is kind of a big one. Uh, learn how to address racism, prejudice, and bias in your communities um, and take them as educational opportunities. Um, because for us, on this side of the spectrum, <laughs> 
um, it creates a communication barrier for us. I, I've actually <coughs> tried to approach people that have come off racist, and they shy away. <laughs> so I don't know how to engage somebody to start breaking down those barriers, um, just because I can't get them into dialogue, but advocates can. They can definitely do that, and um, it's an uncomfortable position to be in, but I've known people to be able to do it, and they've been able to change mindsets that way. So that's a really good, like, honestly, probably one of the most important things that can be done for us to support us at this time. Thank you. Since we went a bit over time, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, I w do want to thank a few people, first of all, for helping to make this happen again, to all of our sponsoring organizations, Sonata, the United Christian Church, Tongue River Winery, B&B, &B, and the Miles City AAUW for making this event happen. We would not have been able to do it without them, so I thank them. Thank you all. Um, I would like to thank our uh, local representation, Kenneth Hallman, for showing up tonight and for being present for this conversation. That was very important. Thank you so much, sir. If you are interested in dialoguing further with the rest of your local representation, you have the opportunity in this very room tomorrow at 7 p.m. And I would strongly encourage you to have those further conversations with your legislators and that constructive feedback that Ms. Sleeper mentioned. Thank you. Um, I also want... I. I would like to encourage people if you wish to stay afterwards to ask questions or to meet. There's a lot of wonderful people in this room to have <laughs> conversations with. Um, I'd like to thank MCC for streaming this live and for being our host for the evening. And please, somebody eat all those cookies. That's <laughs> Someone's up to the challenge. Thank you. Um, and finally, um, I'm sure I speak for everybody in the room, but my overwhelming gratitude to the panel and for your friends and family and advocates who made this event possible um, from the deepest part of myself. Thank you from Miles City. Thank you for taking the time and for sharing so much with us this evening. I learned so much. Um, I haven't even processed it all, so I want to thank everybody. Did you have a comment, Mr. Thayden? Um, do you mind if we take a picture and post this on Facebook to help us spread the word? Yeah. Is that okay? Thank you to our panel. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, friends. Thank you. Everybody's like, do I do that?